wherever they live and at the pace of development. From securing applications at runtime to protecting APIs in any cloud environment, only Imperva offers a unified solution across edge, application, and data to help you achieve more and save money. Start a free trial today and quickly protect your web applications at securityweekly.com forward slash Imperva. Welcome back to Application Security Weekly. We just talked with Christoph Nagy about securing SAP and complex systems through smart defaults, user access, and patching. Always have to be patching. I am your host, Mike Shima. I'm here with John Kinsella, and it's just about time for the news. But first, do you have a specific guest or a topic that you want us to cover on one of the shows? Submit your suggestions by visiting securityweekly.com slash guests and completing the form. We review those suggestions monthly and we'll reach out to you once reviewed. Plus, don't forget to check out our library of on-demand webcasts and recorded technical trainings at securityweekly.com slash on-demand. And now we have the news, and we have quite a bit of news. Uh, some of it is, um, I was trying to figure out how to set this first one up about smart contracts, uh, John. And I was going to I was going to approach it in a, in a spirit of constructiveness. So mm-hmm. I think um, what I'm going to say is, uh, we'll, we'll let you introduce it, and then we have to wait 30 minutes for it to settle in, maybe? Or you have to pay us in order to... I, Working on the metaphor about uh, yeah, the, the, gas, the price, gas prices. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So let's. Uh, while while I think of something pithy to say, why don't you give us something interesting to say about uh, and insightful about this uh, article? Let's see what I can do. Um, so the quick recap for those who are uh, joining in who aren't um, crypto nerds, not that we are, and I mean <laughs> crypto coin, not, not cryptography. We'll talk about that later. Um, with Ethereum and some of the other uh, um, coins out there, you now have the ability to do smart contracts. And you actually see this also in enterprise blockchain as well as um, the these, I don't know if I'd call this retail blockchain, I guess. Um, but at, at the end of the day, what a smart contract is doing is when um, a transaction happens or something, it's a trigger, right? So when something happens around um, a blockchain, either a, um, a buy or a sell, or I think even some other conditions, um, a uh, trigger can be fired, which runs code. And this is where we're actually seeing a good number of the, the vulnerabilities are coming from and, and attacks and, and uh, theft of, of coin and stuff like that. So... Um, this was done, uh, we've, we found a, a, a paper done, it was published by UIUC, um, several uh, um, researchers there. And they did something at least I thought was really interesting. They went out to, it's not a huge group, but they went out, went out and talked to um, almost 30, 29 smart contract developers um, who were ranging from you know several years of experience, two to five years of experience, down to some folks that had just been doing this for a few months. And they started. They they had a a sample program which they they they'd interview them, talk to them, get some. You know, it was a, a in person thing, probably a smaller number, or excuse me, a one on one. So it's not like a you know filling out a, a survey online. It was actually an interview. So they'd start off. They would talk to them, figure out some stuff about them, and then they're showing them this sample of code, which was a um, a smart contract, which they had purposely put a few bugs into. And what they would do, I'm guessing they were recording this, um, but they would actually have the developer talk through how they were reviewing that. Uh, and like, what? okay, step by step, I give you some code. How do you do a review on it, right? Well, what do you do? What do you look for first? Which is actually sort of an interesting thing. I mean, if you asked me that several times in a row over a week, I'd probably have a different answer each time, to be honest, right? How we do this is sort of a human thing. Um, but what they did then with the rest, with the results of this, they took that, you know, the 29 interviews back and did some head scratching. And they came up with um, a sort of a uh, workflows for these guys, like how they would actually go through that. And then also sort of um, almost sort of a grading across uh, several different, um, uh, how would I say, uh, verticals um, of what they actually thought of the code or how they how they um, reviewed that code. So looking at things such as functional correctness, uh, efficiency of gas wise, um, security, codes optimization, uh, development speed, readability, maintainability, upgrade abilities, you're getting ideas, lots of abilities, um, um, if the code is modular, uh, access control. So they're looking at a bunch of different aspects like this. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, but at the end of the day, what they found um, is, so the, to me, the paper's interesting. There's there's some several decent charts. And then the, the workflow, actually looking at how someone would go through this uh, between the junior and the senior coders. I mean, obviously, you're expecting to be different, right? 
Um, you're expecting the senior guy have a little more top press behind what he's doing. But it's interesting to actually see that in a flowchart um, organization of how someone's going through this. Uh, but what they're founding is with the experienced developers, they're able to find 40 to 60 percent of the issues. And the junior coders, um, this was in a fixed period of time. I think they gave them, I want to say an hour, but probably less. It's got to be less. Um, but for the junior coders, they were only finding 20% of the issues. And and the, the takeaway for me on this is we've talked before about at least some of the um, contract languages or they didn't have security in mind when they did, when they designed and wrote the language. But it looks like even security from a point of view of um, usability and uh, readability and how do you actually make sure the code is secure? Even that's missing. So it seems like there's a pretty good amount of work to be done there, uh, either on the trading side, preferably in my mind, that work, some of that work would happen on the, the language de- language development side. But uh, either way, have you skin it, it it's, there's lots of space to improve, which I thought is interesting. Yeah, indeed, lots of space to improve, and I think, and for me, this there there's a theme that's uh, among several of the articles that that I think we pulled together this week that are that are shared with this. So yes, you're right. We're talking about the the smart contracts, but this honestly isn't necessarily unique to smart contracts. The the researchers do make the point that the consequences here can be directly measurable because so much money, you know, these smart contracts are basically handling money in one form or another, and uh, so the consequence can be costly. And we've seen that clearly in DAOs that have gone sideways, in race conditions. That's just, that's a classic case of a, a, a computer security, computer science, you know, programming problem to deal with, as well as just the surprising ways that these contracts interact with each other. And mm-hmm. that's where we've seen some aspects that solidity itself, it's, what do they call it? I hadn't come across the term, but uh, a curly braces like language. It's very much JavaScript-like or ECMAScript to, to use the, the, the official language. But it does have, you know, at least the documentation has a security consideration section, which is good for any language. What was interesting to me is also has that, you know, it, it talks about not fuzzing, uh, but SMT solvers, basically saying, how can we formally verify that this contract or this code does what we think it does. And it's interesting, on the one hand, it's nice to see that appreciation to try and get into this type of analysis and type of confirmation of how the uh, contract is designed. But even with that attention to it, as you were describing, John, in, in this research is showing that, you know, junior, even senior programmers are still struggling with this. And there's still, as we've seen from a lot of the vulnerabilities, a lot of the flaws that have come out and money lost, there's still a big difference between having the potential for formal verification in a design and then even just what the implementation looks like. So you can have something as simple as, did you do a greater than zero or greater than or equal to zero can have a fundamental flaw, you know, have a fundamental flaw that causes suddenly your wallet can never extract money. Um, and we get into lots of interesting edge cases like this. So I, in my mind, there's really good lessons here around the non-input injection style problems in application security, mm-hmm. more about the logical aspects and race conditions. Yeah. So, um, yeah, and that was quite a bit of a, a, a long-winded. I don't know how much gas I just used up there by speaking through it, but uh, our listeners can make their own uh, comments on there. Uh, John, help me out. Anything more to say on this particular <laughs> topic? I think um, my first thought is slightly psychological. Um which is, I actually, it, it rubs me slightly the wrong way to to, to talk about um, formal verification of a language like this, from the point of view of I think there's so much there, there's so much there's so much hype going on in in the the crypto space that I can see people going oh it's been formally verified and like using that with their hype and you know for folks who haven't seen the um, uh, the South Park crypto episode, it's quite good. Makes me think of that. But like, um, it, it's that type of thing of, of, of you know, that, it, that's a great thing, right, in and of itself. But it has this very regal sound to it that people could be like, oh, it's formally <laughs> verified. I can do whatever I want. And um, I saw a VC last week on Twitter talk about, you know, he was trying to compare how, well, he was talking specifically about Bitcoin, but he's talking about crypto being more secure than Visa. I'm like, what are you talking about, dude? Um, and yeah, so 
you know, there's th- that's sort of the state of things is in, unless you actually this the, th- the whole space is so complex and we're just talking about, you know, a contract language, but the space is so complex that like unless you really know what's going on. Um, unless you really research it to a pretty good level of detail, there's phrases being thrown around that people don't really understand, and, and they think this thing is secure when it's, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars are walking out the door before I finish my sentence. So, yeah, it, it's it's improving. I think the attention, not so much that we're giving it, but that in general this is getting from this point of view is going to help things out. So we'll see where it goes over the rest of the year. Yeah, and I think for me, I, I can quickly get exhausted about talking about this space because, you know, yeah. as you mentioned, Visa, I, you know, I will make the comment, you know, Bitcoin's doing 10 or so transactions a second. So, you mm-hmm. know, there's a lot of other engineering <laughs> aspects of this that we could talk about that uh, not perhaps great. But to your point about formal verification that, yes, we do not have, you know, I, I, I play D&D. So, you know, we do not have our wizardly robes. We cannot come down and say this has been formally verified and therefore it is purely secure. Um, you know, even Christoph said, you know, nothing is 100 percent secure. And we can go back to this is a bit reaching just for historically, but Harpley, you could have sort of a formal verification of the handshakes mm-hmm. with between, you know, and, and how that's preserving confidentiality, integrity within a, you know, open SSL uh, handshake TLS setup. But then you have Heartbleed and you have this little bit of a memory leak that can pull things apart. So I will, I think I used the phrase in our last sec, um, segment, necessary but not sufficient. Formal verification is nice. It's great to see that there, just as much as I say, I love to see more fuzzing uh, built into the, you know, the, the SDLC, but it's definitely not going to be sufficient and it's not going to be the thing that saves us all or that proves that we're actually secure. So we'll still have jobs in AppSec, I think. Another reason we'll st- <laughs> another reason we'll still have jobs in AppSec is because we see incidents like Heroku, uh, and this one I pulled out not to unfortunately you know kind of beat a dead horse, kick them while they're down, but it does have two lessons in it. One, there is the communications uh, aspect of Heroku, and we just talked about the communications with our other instance of Okta, which you know had a lot of. It, call it initial ambiguity, a lot of questions, a lot of concerns, which ultimately did boil down to not a massive breach in perspective of the attack surface, the amount of customers that were ultimately effective. But there were several months of questions about who was affected. So this is, again, looking at Heroku, have a, the their incident 2413. They're talking about the comms. They have a link to a blog post from their GM um, that talks about what they're going to do better, how to, to uh, do that aspect of communication. So I just wanted to highlight that. But also, on the technical side, there was Definitely a part here that raised my eyebrow in the sense of this started off with compromise of some OAuth tokens, and apparently an attacker was able to pivot access from an OAuth token into the data store where hashed usernames and passwords are and exfiltrate that data. That sounds to me like a weakness in architecture. Like it sounded to me there's a bunch of things that fell down there on architecture encryption side and sort of reminiscent of that complexity we were just talking about with uh, Christoph in the last segment. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if you want to dive into any more of that, John, or if um, maybe there's other interesting things that that grab your attention this week. Oh, where do I want to go? Uh, (laughs) I I don't know. Not really. Um, Yeah, it's it's I, I think. The most, uh, yeah, that uh, there was a um, a very uh, significant eyebrow raise as I was reading that and going like, wait, they got access to what? So yeah, that's not great. Um, I, I, yeah, it's the the communication is um, to me the most important aspect of it too. So um, you know, the GM, I was just looking, he's new on the job. He's only been there, um, uh, God, a month. Welcome to, to Heroku. Uh, but uh, yeah, the, the, the communication is a super important aspect here. It's like it, some, com- some organizations, I won't get, say companies, some organizations get it, some don't. Sometimes it's going to take a while for, you know, to get through legal and, you know, hopefully not have too much whitewashing by the marketing team. But that's, it, it really is important. That that's what builds trust, which, you know, as we say often, security is trust. Um, mm-hmm. And it, 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 that's, yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'm repeating myself, so I'll shut up. 
<laughs> no, but I'll I'll try to repeat you slightly differently to to pull out one more what one more talking point out of that. I think that that will be on the technical side. We talk about threat modeling, doing a lot of just technical analysis, analysis of the business logic of an application. And I think to just to pick up on your point, it would also be great just to threat model, well, what if a breach happened? And this goes a little bit in the sense of the the, the stance of assume breach, which is the zero trust. And I just did my hand wave there because I don't want to get into too much of the, 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 the marketing side of things. But as an exercise, sort of a what would you do tabletop exercise can be very useful, meaning uh, our password hashes were exposed. Who do we have to get involved? Does it need to be legal? Does it need to be marketing for that matter? Sales, other, you know, basically everyone other than just the CISO and the engineering team that needs to to fix the code. So could still be a very important exercise to do, especially if you're doing it as an exercise and not under the gun in real time when there is, you know, the clock is ticking and the, uh, the InfoSec Twitter is making fun of you. Um, but now we're going to shift back to a theme, I think, that is coming around the the Solidity paper that, that you brought up and that came out of the UIUC, which I also uh, uh, love that institution because they gave us LLVM and the, the LLVM compiler and a lot of its tooling, its uh, security analysis tools, which here from Trail of Bits, we've actually grabbed a couple of their blogs the last couple of weeks. Uh, one of their researchers went to real world crypto, as in cryptography, and gave a nice summary of the uh, conference. And the one that stands out to me that I wanted to, to highlight as broad for everyone to, whether you're working on crypto or not, this I think is general to just software development. The, the heading title, security tooling is still too difficult to use. And then it does break down into some more details about that. So it's not just an empty aphorism. But one of the takeaways there that was interesting, uh, touches on what you had mentioned too, John, is that uh, I'm going to quote again from the, the blog write-up. There's a, a leaky pipeline from awareness, and we could say awareness of contract issues, even though this blog is talking about awareness of timing vulnerabilities, which I think are pretty neat, but a leaky pipeline from awareness of an issue to the tool awareness, meaning, for example, does Solidity have in your SMT solvers, can they actually find these types of, of issues and are even in developers using those tools? And uh, so that's what was pretty interesting just to see. You know, we need, do need to get beyond just October as Cybersecurity Awareness Month to people using tools to what this blog post was saying that really spoke to my heart, getting a lot of those tools into the compiler um, just because that's where the, the the code is being built. So hopefully that's where a lot of analysis can be done. So th there are a lot of other neat things in this blog post that are specific to initialization vectors reuse, a lot of very crypto specific items. But this was a takeaway that still I think is universal and it's, it's something to, to take to heart for, for any AppSec team. Yeah, the one that caught man, my eye, um, if mm -hmm. I can scroll back up to quote it, is um, so close to where you were uh, on the overhead of mm. uh, security tooling. Um, and this, you know, this is sort of what, you know, my day job is trying to fix right now, but um, many of the tools involve significant learning curves that would take up too much of developers already limited time. So tie that back to what you're just saying around, um, you know, um, October being security month, if it's October, whatever month it is. Um, <laughs> yeah. You know, the, the, the point being like, it, it is something that we need to be thinking about all year round, but you know, as with every other month or day or anything we have out there, everyone wants to be sharing that time all the time. So how do we, we, we can't all become experts at either crypto or um, cryptography or crypto coin or um, <laughs> the security aspect or security tools. This stuff has to be made easy for people to use. Um, and as you said, you can do that through building it into the compiler or however, however we get around doing that. The next thing is if you build it into the compiler, then the errors have to be um, understandable and explainable, and LLVM is pretty good with that. Others aren't quite as good. I'm looking at Yugo. Um, but, that, you know, how, how do we, and I know this is going to take years, so as you said, we're going to be happily employed for a while, but how do you how do you make that overall process? Um, humans are weak from a point of view of um, we're not always going to catch every little mistake. That's what security is why we're here. But then how do you how do you fix that? How do you make it easy both to catch the mistake, to understand how to fix a mistake, or you know, preferably don't make the mistake in the first place if you have secure defaults? But um, that one really resonates with me. 
It does. And what's you're you're helping me a lot, uh, John, this week, tie all of our articles together, because what you're saying, too, is, you know, even in, with compiler errors, make them human friendly. I used to write a lot of C++ code, and um, this may surprise you, but sometimes that code had bugs, especially when I was trying to do <sighs> template programming. And if you've ever tried to read the error from a template, <laughs> a bug in C++, um, you know, 15 minutes later, as the, your screen has stopped scrolling, it finally says a line number that has nothing whatsoever to do with what the problem was. <laughs> Fortunately, uh, tools, compilers like LLVM have invested in trying to make that a little bit more insightful, a little bit helpful. Uh, a couple weeks ago, uh, we also uh, had an article from Rust that was talking about a, kind of a, another developer survey where they were affectionately uh, talking about, you know, Rust in the sense of the errors that the compiler gives back were helpful. So, um, mm -hmm. you know, not, you know, I'm, I think we always do try to avoid language wars because honestly, I most of the time, I really don't care what the language is, other than did you yeah. write it for someone else to read? Is the language intuitive or understandable, or the code that you wrote intuitive or understandable? And that's honestly, honestly where we also see a lot of those smart contract vulnerabilities come out of uh, as well. And it's, you know, I'll, I'll, real quick on that one, I think that's an interesting point. The, the only reason we're using a programming language is so that, you know, a group of us can communicate and share that those concepts right it's it and it also it's easier for us than you know writing in bits machine code but mm -hmm. um in many cases i mean we, we see um you know communities forming around different technologies in different areas so the nowadays the machine learning guys like python um uh the who likes rust someone likes rust um uh, there's a lot of folks out there, you know, the, the Kubernetes crowd and the container crowd really like Go. Um, so there's these different sort of communities that involve around different languages. And, and, you know, those languages have been picked for some reason, something good or, you know, beneficial about them. Um, the, the, let's say the kernel guys are, are starting like Rust, how about that? Um, so, but at the same time, it, it's just a, a, you know, that's really the reason that's there. It's if you've ever worked in a team where um, I was doing a code review last week. So we've got CDK that's in TypeScript. Um, some of our data pipelines are now in Python. Most of our code is in Go, and then throw a make file in there with some shell scripting. And like in one code review, I was going through like four languages switching back and forth in my head. Um, that's when it hits you, right? It's like, how can you, you're trying to be secure. Now you're asking me to be secure across four different languages. Um, <laughs> or if it's, you know, mm -hmm. a bit bigger than that, that, that's when these things become issues. Um, so yeah, the, the language itself, you know, usually I don't care too much. I might have my own personal favorites, but um, yeah, you know, that's just one aspect of it. It is. And I think I, I think Christoph in the last segment also mentioned some awk strip scripts at one point. And um, <laughs> now there's probably only, you know, a dozen people that would appreciate me going into a tangent and saying, wow, really, awk scripts? Can you read those and understand those? But that to your point that, you know, there is a wealth of just oh, context switching that our brains have to do. And we also talked about, you know, when you turn a shell script into some Python or Go or something like else like that, because we had a couple examples of shell scripts gone wrong. And that's also what I want to take um, a, a segue into, this path reversal fall, flaw woo in uh, the OWASP ESAPI uh, library. And the thing that stood out to me was, yes, obviously, the path reversal, I love it. But the, the quote near the end of the article from uh, the Daily Swig uh, says that there's mostly an unawareness of everyone who previously touched the code that this particular function acts differently when a value for a directory is not slash terminated. And then the key sentence right to follow it says, I think that's a bit unintuitive. And to me, unintuitive is sort of, it's one of those aspects that's kind of damning with faint praise. You know, uh, unintuitive is why I used to pick on Perl quite a bit, because there's so many different assumptions based on not even just human readable text, but syntax. And humans are, I think, I think it's fair to say we're more used to reading like letters and numbers than we are syntax. So suddenly that's where shell scripts or Perl and awk for that matter gets really crazy. And here is a vulnerability in the ESAPI that, you know, the vuln itself I don't think is that big a deal. This is, this is nowhere near a log4j type of scenario. But the lesson there in this unintuitive code, even in a security library, um, spoke to me. I mean, 
it, it is, as you said, it's impressive that it survived so long. I mean, this is a bit of code which is being written, I think I'll say by experts. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's been here. For, I mean, I was recommending devs to use ESAPI, what, 10 years ago? It feels like, no, probably. So, um, you know, it comes back to, what, and again, another of my, my, I don't want to say rants, but comments I keep making is like, <laughs> we're taking something which has been designed for security, written by security people mm-hmm. who are like, you know, probably fairly active consultants, and they still made this mistake. Um, and it lived for that long. Yeah, it, it's, it's un, un, I mean, isn't, when I think ESAPI, that's C++, isn't it? At least uh, Java. What Java. I, I thought that, well, okay. Um, I think they had, yes, I think they started a C++ project as well, but um, um, possibly Java was just the, the path of less resistance in yeah, terms yeah. of the, the brain trust around it. But I, I think, doing, but, but, yeah, oh, go, go ahead. ahead. Okay, no, no, that, that's that it. There was a, there was an aspect here. The other reason I wanted to talk about ESAPI was, you know, we, at least for me, I love to throw around the phrase paved road or guardrails. Uh, but once again, it's really easy just to say, yes, let's have a paved road and then walk away from that statement and not have to do anything. And, um, you know, to tie back to our segment with Christoph, there's a big difference between saying, have a run book or go and patch your SAP system versus, Oh, you have to set up, you know, work through change management, which can be a bureaucratic nightmare. I don't want to give you some PTSD on that mm-hmm. aspect, John. I apologize. Um, but, you know, building a paved road like ESAPI, that seems intuitively, oh, I'm going to use that term, what that should have been. But if you go to the project page, you know, I think anecdotally, ESAPI, I don't know how much uptake it ever got. And there's even a tab right now about should I use it in the sense that, ESAPI may have outlived its neededness. I'm not going to say usefulness, but how it was needed at the time for Java secure programming. And maybe there's a lot better alternatives. Or maybe my question here is, you know, how what are the criteria that make something a paved road that security team is building and engineering for adoption versus maybe this is just kind of like the 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 exit. Off, the, you know, this is just an off ramp that developers aren't going to use, even though the security engineering team invested a lot of effort into it. So, it's sort of getting into maybe call it the the product management aspect of of, of a paved road, mm-hmm. and um, it's it's not a fully completed thought as I was going through this. So, I'm going to pause here and um, hope that John, in the 30 seconds or longer I've been talking about this, you've <laughs> formed something to uh, pull me out of this. Oh, most definitely. Um, okay. The first, going back to the psychology point of view, um, our, our, our discussions, when you pull up this uh, ESAPI page and go to the, the Should I Use tab, um, if you're going to have a section titled Should I Use Something, <laughs> uh, the first letters afterwards should not be N-O. Um, they, they have a note in there, but like the way my brain works, I look at that and I see no, and I'm like, oh, that's not off to a good start. Um, yeah. But where I would go with this, you know, like it's been a while since I've touched this thing. Um, but what's interesting is from the point of view of are the languages improving or are, are the other frameworks improving? Like, you know, you love talking about uh, um, some of the web frameworks. Mm-hmm. And, I'm, you know, they, they have a mention here of, of, you know, if you're going to try and secure something new, um, look at the output encoding of the HTML standardization, the validation stuff, the cryptography, the auth, the CSRF. Um, so they're they're sort of referencing some other things, but I'm wondering also if um, you know there's probably not very many new projects in Java. I'm guessing there are, but not as frequent as some other modern languages we just talked about. Because as I said, the communities move on. Um, so maybe that's part of it. Um, I mean, they've got and then they've got mentions in here of like SNCC and GitHub. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, so in other words, there's other tools which are probably coming along which make this less, um, I don't want to say needed, but needed. So I think that's sort of an interesting aspect of it. Does that tell us? Does that allow us to telegraph that statement a little bit further and say um, security is improving? Maybe, possibly. I don't know if we can go quite that far, but um, I'll, I'll, I'm going to hope for that. 
uh, maybe possibly sounds good to me. I think that's the best we're going to get out of this. <laughs> because that, that I, I'm going to take that once again to tie into um, to the two other articles that go back to a little bit of cryptography. One is uh, the 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 post quantum quirk cryptography posture. And this is an article from Dark Reading that really for me, uh, once again, this is a, a week of quotes for me. I want to quote from this article that where it says, although the reality of a quantum computing threat is likely years away, maybe possibly, uh, the country needs to prepare now. And to me, this is basically the, well, what, did, you know, how long did it take us to get off of MD5, SHA-1, you know, a, a 512-bit for your RSA keys. We, we saw that with uh, D him in, in the email space. Even Google had very short uh, keys for, for some of it uh, at one point. And so it's sort of the idea that we know we have to change. How do we set up some concrete plans to do this and what works best? Meaning, do we just need to every October for the next five years to say, get ready for your post-quantum crypto algorithm, start using them? Or can we start pushing for something like TLS 1.3 that was really smart to say, rather than give you all these options like you used to have in the ciphers in TLS 1.0, 1.2, and so on, we're just going to say, you've got you know AES GCM, you've got maybe two other modes, you can't you know you you can't downgrade to ask for a for a you know something that was a, basically a ROT 13 type of cipher. And this is a good thing. Or maybe we're going to start to get better just within the libraries, within the compilers. It says, not only is this deprecated, but maybe it's deprecated and we're going to stop supporting it. Um, something like that. So this is me just reaching for that idea that we know we as AppSec industry know that certain things are being deprecated. We have to make change. But what are the smart ways? What are the effective ways that we've seen successfully execute on that change? Man, you're really trying to trigger me this week with uh, all the things you're mentioning. <laughs> um, I'm just waiting for the mention day who will go unnamed, and then I'm really going to have to have a or have to have a chat. Um, uh, yeah, I, I think you're you're bringing up some good points. Um, I think what's really interesting to me right now related to this is um, just the traction this seems to be getting um, from the current White House administration, leave the politics out of it, even though you can't with that, those combination of words. Um, but they seem to be making, obviously they're making a splash uh, from the point of view of getting people to talk about it. Um, I was moderating a, a Cloud Security Alliance panel recently on um, Zero Threat. Uh, and, you know, one of the first things people were talking about was, oh, well, the White House, and you're like, so between that, between this, I mean, post-quantum just sounds great. It's going to get into the news. Um, <laughs> yes. But, it, you know, I say I'm slightly, I'm only being slightly snarky when I mean, I mean, it's a good thing, right? I, I like, you know, I'm a big fan of, of um, um, PR stunts, honestly. So, hey, if a phrase like that catches attention, more power to you. It is something that needs to be thought about. But it, it's, you know, one of the questions I was asking on that panel is, okay, do you think they're going to hit the zero trust? They've got a deadline for what, 2023? So like a year from now? I'm like, do you think they're going to hit that? And the general consensus was it doesn't matter because there's enough, it's getting enough of a spotlight onto it that people are moving and they're moving in that direction. And any any move in that direction is, is a really great thing. So I think I'll probably say the same thing here for this. Um, and I think that's, you know, it's I don't know how long that spotlight, any of these individual spotlights, I don't know how long they're going to burn bright. Mm -hmm. But I, I love the, the at least the reaction which I'm seeing to it so far. It, it's it's surprising to me, and I, I might have even on this podcast said at some point, um, good luck. That date's never going to be hit, but um, <laughs> it seems like it's getting people to move, which is is pretty great. It is, and I think I think that it'll move from the consumer space because we do have, and we can call it a hegemony or just call it a small group of browser vendors. But from a consumer perspective, the browsers are pushing forward because, you know, we've got three major browsers and, you know, a, a few others, but that's where they're going to build in TLS 1.3 support, HTTP 3 support for that matter. And that's going to be a positive thing. So at the edge across the internet, we may have a lot of this good uh, march towards post-quantum algorithms. 
But the internal side of enterprises, uh, once again, just a call back to, you know, talking about with Christoph, SAP, these are going to be the clunkier ones that are probably uh, going to make it make that prophecy come true, John, where they're they're mm-hmm. not, you know, good luck hitting that date. Yeah. So uh, it, at the risk of so I'm not going to try to trigger you trigger you anymore. I'm just going to stutter for a bit and just go and 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 and. And, and this is just a wonderful bug. So someone, I, I for, I'm going to say someone, I apologize for not getting the, the initial reporter of this, their name, but someone identified that drop five ands delimited by periods into a Google doc. And suddenly you've got a denial of service for it. And there are a couple other, uh, uh, phrases that that are a couple other words that would work in here as well, but to me this was just a, a very fun vuln to to end on in the sense that we talked about formal verification of software, we talked about fuzzers, we talked about compilers, and you can drop five ands into a Google Doc and you got denial of service. So uh, once again, AppSec is always going to be entertaining and interesting for us, John. I I I I personally am sort of hoping this is a an Easter egg that someone put in and just we're waiting to see if someone would whack it. Um, I mean, maybe it's real. I, I I don't know. I I saw it. My first thought when I saw it was like, oh, I want to try it. I never got around to it. It's probably patched by now, anyways. But um, yeah, maybe maybe that is. Uh, you know, how do you test for that? How do you? Um, it's sort of if if it is a bug, it's a pretty great example of um, you know, they're always building a better idiot. Like, what do you fuss for this? What? <laughs> um, I don't know. Uh, but yeah, it, it's a a good note to end on. Um. One more thing to test on my code, huh? <laughs> that is what. What is the grammar checking for your uh, enterprise code they're doing? Uh, so, with that, one more thing. I don't think there's anything we can do to top that one for now. So, I'm just going to wrap things up and say thank you to John for once again helping us walk through the news and the interview. Thanks everyone who's listening. Uh, don't forget to um, please subscribe, give us a like, check out the show notes. And speaking of ands, check out the the band And One uh, in particular. I love their albums, Body Pop and Tanzo Matt. And with that, we'll see you next week on Application Security Weekly.